So thank you. Um, as, as mentioned, I, I'll be talking about diversity and taxonomy for glenophytes, only photosynthetic ones. And um, of course, I'm, I'm going to talk uh, about the work of generations of, of scientists because it started quite early. And oh, using headphones? Yeah. I don't have headphones, so I can use my microphone. I'm sorry? Can, can I turn on my speaker? Uh, somebody no, no, no. I, I, can I turn on my speaker? Could you mute all of that? Yeah, and okay. just, thank you, thank God. Yeah, I'm just gonna do that now. Can I... All right, Anna, you could go ahead, please. Anna, you have to unmute. Oh, okay, okay. Now it's working. Okay, perfect. Okay, once again then. Um, so, um, hello, uh, my name is Anna and I'm, I'm going to talk about the in taxonomy of uh, glenophytes and that will be of course the work of, of many generations of, of scientists. Um, and as you see on this photo, the glens are quite beautiful, large cells, relatively easy to see under the light microscope. So that is probably why already very early in the uh, in the science, actually in the history of science, they were described uh, for the first time in Ehrenberg in 1830, so with pretty basic microscope. And what he wrote about the first species he described and first genus, Oblena, was uh, not very specific, but he wrote this uh, a fusiform flagellate metabolic cell with green in the middle. Um, and that of course still holds true, but, but it's not very specific. Another I uh, think you, you already can observe on this very first, very, very beautiful drawing is that even within a one species, there's a huge variation of, of morphology, especially the cell shape and the size. And that's probably one of the reasons, this huge variation of within a, in, in, at the level of the species, as well as the relatively easy access to these uh, cells, um, because they are widespread in the fresh waters, that we have so many taxa. So there are 3,000 taxa described based on morphological features in the last 200 years. Most of them actually quite early, and um, most of the genera uh, were described, those which were described based on morphology were described actually between 1830 and 1930. So those 10 genera were, were described in the, in the first 100 years of research on this group, uh, and many of them very, very early, many of them by Ehrenberg. So they're quite distinct based on morphologies at the genus level. Things start to uh, change uh, in the end of uh, 20th century uh, when the first sequence of Euglena was, uh, was obtained. That was 18S sequence from Euglena gracilis in 1996. And uh, from, from that moment, we started to accumulate DNA sequences, uh, mainly 18S, but later on also, of course, other uh, molecular markers. And those were used for phylogenies and for taxonomy, and that resulted in quite many changes. So first of all, thanks to the sequences, it was possible to obtain a, a reliable uh, phylogenetic tree. It's a multi-gene tree, uh, well supported, well resolved, uh, especially at the genus level, uh, with only one genus currently non-monophyletic. Um, and actually, um, in this last 15 years, where the, just these trees were built over and over, uh, five new genera were also established, and four of them uh, only based or mainly based on the molecular data. So those four genera were uh, established from the species previously classified as, as in the genus Euglena. Um, so they are morphologically somehow similar to genus Euglena, but are distant, and this is genus Euglenaria, Euglenaformis, Discoplastis, and very recently, uh, genus Flexiglena, sister to Lepocinclis and Facus. Uh, one genus uh, was described only based, uh, sorry, one genus was described not only based on the molecular data, but also just on the discovery of a new lineage, uh, and that's a Rapaza, genus Rapaza, a mono, monotypic uh, genus with a single species Rapaza viridis discovered in 2013. Uh, it's a marine uh, mixotrophic early branching uh, euglenophyte. Uh, as, as you all know, we are uh, quite limited with the transcriptomic and uh, genomic data. Actually, there are no many, not many data available, so we're not able to reconstruct phylogenomic trees right now for euglenophytes. 
one of the alternatives is to use either this multi-gene analysis, but it's quite tedious to obtain all the sequences. Another option, which I suggest here, is to use plastic genomes, which um, of course uh, have, uh, which give us the chance to use at least 60 genes to reconstruct phylogenies. So those are already quite uh, large data sets. And those trees are, as far as we know, in full agreement with uh, what we know from other molecular markers. So they might be uh, alternative source of um, phylogenetic information. Um, as I mentioned, a lot of sequences were generated for this taxonomic and phylogenetic reasons, um, mainly 18S, and they are, of course, all deposited in gene bank. But as we also know, the gene bank is not changing their taxonomy very quickly and not adjusting to what we know uh, now about taxonomy. So um, there is an initiative of 18S RNA Collaborative Annotation Initiative, UCREF, and UCREF is uh, focusing on many groups of protists, but also recently uh, we finished the annotation of both, uh, actually of the whole excavator group, but also including euglenophiles and heterotrophic euglenids. So all the sequences uh, were re-annotated sequences which are in the gene bank were re-annotated based on our current knowledge of the taxonomy and the reference tree was built. And that will be soon available in the database, journal database uh, for, um, for, for all of us. And this reference tree might be used and it's very useful for um, the placement of short sequences uh, coming from uh, large expeditions such as Tara. Here is an example. We use Tara sequence and we place them on this reference tree to reveal the diversity of oglenophytes in marine environments. Not surprising, of course, the, the largest diversity is uh, in known marine genera, such as Atreptia or Eutreptiella, but there are also some lineages of uh, previously only known as freshwater uh, taxa, uh, but now we know they, they might be also present, although rarely, but they might be present in marine environments. And one last, uh, I think I want to mention about our challenges in the taxonomy and, and phylogeny is that 85% um, of the sequence which were, uh, are available right now are coming from the strains which are deposited in cultural collections. So I, I made a quick analysis of the strains uh, deposited in the largest uh, cultural collections and um, obviously they represent only most common species. So um, that's a one problem and those species constitute only a small fraction of described diversity. So if we assume there is a 3,000 described, uh, described taxa, there is only around 700 strains in culture collections, and maybe around half of them will represent actually different taxa. So there are some duplicates, there are many strains of the same species, especially ground gracilis, for example. So in fact, we have an access to only 10% of, in culture, we have only access to around 10% of described diversity. How to deal with that? Well, through a combined approaches, which will uncover the full diversity. So um, environmental um, sampling and environmental DNA sequencing, which will lead to assessment of species diversity and also color, of course, culturing and single cell uh, approaches, which together um, might both in, in, um, inform us about the morphology uh, and also um, allow us to uh, expand to uh, reference databases. So this kind of approach is already used and here is a very recent example of the uh, group of taxa similar to Lepocinclis ovum, a very common taxon in fresh water. So the authors here use six strains from culture collections and also 52 isolates from, from, uh, from the environment. And thanks to that, uh, um, they were able to uh, obtain DNA and build a phylogenetic tree with uh, 15 clades, and each of these clades has a distinct morphology. And this, um, together, this phylogeny and the distinct morphology is observed uh, in, uh, from live cells, from these uh, isolates, allowed to, uh, to um, end up with 15 species, which, will, which are well-defined based on both molecular and morphological features. So to sum up, uh, I think the future directions to 
um, so how and expand our knowledge about diversity and, and help us with the taxonomy is of course to uh, sample environment and do env both environmental sequencing but also obtain new um, cultures and obtain if it's not possible to obtain a culture or um, to maintain the culture to work with single cell uh, picking and single cell sequencing also as an alternative at least until we'll be able to sequence genomes uh, easier alternative for phylogenomic analysis um, is the plastic genome sequencing, which we can also use for phylogenies. Thank you very much. Uh, and of course, many thanks to my coworkers from University of Warsaw uh, and uh, collaborators in Prague, Vlade Hambulab, and also in Michigan State University, Richard Trimmer and Matt Bennett. Thanks. Uh, it's a really nice talk to get us going with. Uh, I have one question in the chat and I just want to encourage anyone who wants to ask a question to, to put it in the chat and I'll go try and get through it. As we've got a bit of time, because um, we missed a talk, we, 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 can, uh, we can make that up. Um, so the first one I have from uh, uh, Sergio Guerrero. Uh, can you just comment on how trypanosomatids and euglenoids are related phylogenetically? I think there are better specialists than yeah. me on that, but um, um, well, um, there is a still a kind of ongoing debate, I guess, about the symbiontids, and I know uh, Alistair is here, and maybe Gordon is here, who might have a newer data on that, but um, well, basically that depends how symbiontids will locate, and then either they are sister to uh, both symbiontids and onglanes, or, or they're yeah, kind of, that's a deeper, deeper yeah. branching yeah. problem than only yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, the um, um So uh, I don't, I saw another comment there, but the, uh, uh, about uh, taxa and habitats. So, I mean, I think people will have that conversation about the relationship with the trypanosomatids. Uh, you can continue that through the chat uh, if, if you wish, otherwise we'll spend we could just have a whole meeting on that. Um, I would have one other question for you then. So you mentioned that although there's thousands of described tax or maybe a few hundred perhaps um, uh, in culture collections, can you say how they're distributed amongst the diversity, what's in culture collections? Or do you think there are, certain, there, there are entire groups where you have no cultures whatsoever? Um. If we, from the genera, which I mentioned, we have the relatively good representation from each of them, mm -hmm. but there are still the genera described in the past, which we kind of don't know if they're still, if they're glenophytes or not. So there are like, nobody ever confirmed uh, that those things exist anymore. <laughs> so either we never sample them or they're just not the glenids. So that's um, maybe a little bit, uh, yeah. Problem, but in the from the species we we are sampling, uh, there is a some sort of a representation equally distributed within genera at least. Um, maybe a little bit marine species are, are under sampled. Okay, Rapata, thank, thank. Yes, I see the the question. Apaza, I think, is available in U in uh, not Utex, the and other American collection. I think it's available there, but I'm not sure in what shape it is there. Okay, thank you. I'm going to move on because we've nearly caught up with time despite missing an entire presentation. So we're running double time. Um, so we're going to go to the first flash talk.